yeah. Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for being with us today. If somebody wouldn't mind just uh, saying hello in the chat box and make sure we're broadcasting. Uh, we are broadcasting live from uh, uh, Tampa, Florida. And David, where are you? Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. Thank you all for uh, joining us today. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of, uh, while the room populates, a little bit of uh, Zoom housekeeping here. You're all so familiar with this for sure. Um, the uh, uh, chat box and the Q&A are there for you. And depending on how you <clears throat> are watching this on your desktop or your phone, you can do either. And uh, we not only is it available, we encourage you to ask questions and welcome them all. And uh, we have qu quite a few people uh, on today, so we'll get to as many as we can. But don't be shy. Go ahead and ask whatever you care to uh, throughout the presentation as it comes to mind, and we'll get to them um, periodically through. And uh, Again, thank you for sharing your time with us today. We have uh, about an hour. And uh, uh, just for the record, this is being recorded and uh, will be available on the Family Office Insights YouTube channel as a recording. And also I would uh, uh, suggest that if there was anybody that after hearing this or during that you care to uh, put in touch with uh, David, um, you are most welcome to do so. And we would also, of course, be grateful if it's for you or, or somebody that you might know that would benefit from knowing about what David's doing here. I super appreciate it. Um, and I know David will as well. So the objective, just to be clear, is to uh, uh, in today is, is to raise an awareness about uh, what David is doing with his nonprofit. And, uh, and explain to you what, why he's doing it and how, is it, how it's gonna come about. Um, I see a bunch of friends that uh, I haven't seen in a while and I'm gonna shout out to uh, Ivan. So don't make, wanna make the rest of you feel bad, but nice to see you. Um, Ivan's been a member of the community for almost as old as I am. So that was really a joke. But the, uh, so welcome everybody. Thank you for spending your precious uh, afternoon with us here. And with that, um, I'd like to introduce David Siegel. And I know that you're going to not only enjoy hearing what you uh, are going to hear from David, but it's super, super interesting stuff and it affects all of us. So David, take it away. Arthur, thank you. It's a pleasure to present. I believe we have members of the audience here from as far away as Africa and California. So some people are up very late at night and some people it's mid morning. Uh, welcome to everyone. My name is David Siegel. I'm looking for donors to launch my new nonprofit, the Giordano Bruno Institute. Now, for the next 19 minutes, I'll explain the problem I want to solve, the solution. I'll tell you who Giordano Bruno was, and then I'll give a summary in Elvish. <laughs> and I'll boil the entire project down to one single word and ask for a few million dollars. So let's get going. I'm a lifelong te technology entrepreneur. I've started over a dozen companies. I've written five books and created products you see around you every day. In 2010, I wrote a book explaining that we could use data in a smarter way. Now in 2017, I created the Pillar Project around the concept of my book. I launched a blockchain fundraiser that raised $21 million from over 10,000 people. And I created a Swiss nonprofit uh, foundation to build the personal data locker, so we could all benefit from using our own personal data. But because it was a blockchain project and it has a token, the team decided to go in a different direction called decentralized finance. So now I'm raising money a second time, the good old fashioned way, with a standard 501c3 nonprofit to build the personal data locker for real. So let me tell you a story. I'll start with this quick story. In January, 2012, Facebook data scientists ran a one week experiment on almost 700,000 users. Half were shown content with happy and positive words. The other half were shown content that was sadder than average. What happened when the week was over, those manipulated users were more likely to post either especially positive or negative words themselves. Facebook showed they could manipulate people's feelings. Have you seen the movie, The Social Dilemma? 
Roger McNamee, a former advisor of Mark Zuckerberg, who was in the movie, wrote a book and he warned the world saying, Facebook enables advertisers to identify an emotional hot button for individual voters that can be pressed for electoral advantage, irrespective of its relevance to the election. Candidates no longer have to search for voters who share their values. Instead, they can invert the model using micro-targeting to identify whatever issue motivates and upsets each voter and play to that. And this is the weaponization of social media. What matters to Facebook and Twitter is how much time you spend on their platform. We spend more time when we're angry and upset. So first they create that anger and then they sell you to advertisers, fringe groups and political parties. This fundamentally changes tech companies from providing tools and solutions to manipulating and monetizing their customers' behavior. And this is how extremists build their base. More and more politicians must use social media to get the votes they need. Platforms like Facebook and Twitter gave Trump the tools to get elected and then to create a mob that invaded the Capitol building. And it's, it's regardless of party, all politicians now have to get elected by gaming the system. And that today social media is a critical part of a broken system. What makes this bad is not the engagement, it's that these platforms are designed to maximize profit for their shareholders, not for society. If you think about it, I'm weaponizing PowerPoint right now, trying to get you upset so you'll pay more attention and want to support me in fixing the problem. Now, where's your personal data? Well, you don't have it. These companies here have it. Your phone company has a record of every place you visit. You're being tracked as you visit websites. Your medical history is available to companies who pay for it. And everyone knows you've gained a few pounds since Thanksgiving. Is it safe? Listen, just last week, there was a huge hack on Gmail, LinkedIn, and Netflix who lost 3 billion passwords, probably including yours. So seriously, if you have one of those services, you should probably change your password today. There are hundreds of data breaches each year. Many include phone numbers, addresses, social security numbers, and credit card numbers. The FBI can force them to turn over our data and tell them where we've been, who we've called, every text message we've ever sent, browsing history, etc. Can we really trust these companies to be on our side? Have you actually read your end user license agreements? The system we have today is extractive. The deal is we get ease of use and they sell our data to the highest bidder. We become their most valuable asset and they give us everything we want except the ability to find a competitor's product. This is called vendor lock-in. In fact, you can buy any Apple product on Amazon except one. Which one? The Apple HomePod. You can't buy that on Amazon because it competes with Alexa. That is not an accident. Speaking of accidents, there are now 5 million apps in the App Store. That makes apps practically invisible. You have to rely on Apple's algorithm to show you the one you want, rather than the one where a company has gained the search engine to show you something else. People don't have time to find an app that'll be worth installing and creating a new account, let alone using. I want to build a new platform, a single app, where you can own and manage your personal data. And that's what I want to tell you about now. Here are the basic components. This is going to go by quickly. It's a high level summary based on the concepts in my book, Pull, which is actually still not, not a bad read even 10 years later. It starts with your personal data locker, with your name, address, birth date, phone number, et cetera. But everything is syndicated. So if you change your address or your phone number, it changes everywhere at the same time. Imagine all the contracts, websites, apps, and other places where your address is. And imagine trying to change those all manually. Well, we don't have to imagine. That's the world we live in right now. Even though we have tons of data, we still end up doing a lot of things ma manually. Doesn't that make you angry and upset? <laughs> the idea of the data locker is to separate your data from your advice, your devices. Your data should live in the cloud and only you should have the keys. I shouldn't. Take any handset, anybody's handset, log in, and that handset becomes your device. In a few years, handsets will begin to disappear anyway. 
we'll just interact with our environment using whatever device recognizes us. Information you, you need should come to you as you need it. Glasses, earbuds, watches, other small devices will help us as we go throughout our day. In many cases, we'll just talk to our environment and it'll recognize our voice. Your personal data is with you wherever you go and you're, you'll be as anonymous as you want to be. We're all willing to trade privacy for convenience, right? As long as it's on our terms and easy to manage. So we should say to vendors, hey, how about you read my end user license agreement for a change, huh? The main point of a self-sovereign identity is that you create it, you own it, you maintain and control it. It's not a government app. Dozens of groups are working on this now and it's pretty far along, but it needs adoption. You'll build your own social network on my platform with people you know and trust. You'll give them access to only the information you want them to have. Every message you send, every photo you share will be done using a digital contract. And because the platform is nonprofit, there's alignment of incentives between the platform and its users. Would you move to a new social network if you owned your own place in it? It'll be your digital castle and you will hold the keys, not me. To understand the world of offers, think of Kayak. You've used Kayak before. You say where you want to go and when and the time of departure and landing, airlines, price, etc. And then the flights are sorted according to your wishes. They're not sorting according to the algorithm or the companies. It's according to your parametric uh, specifications. So what if you could do that for everything? What if finding a lawyer, maybe from finding a lawyer to finding a babysitter, getting a new insurance policy, a new car, a new piece of art, a new phone? The idea is to create a nonprofit comparison engine. So whenever you're looking for anything, you just ask and the answers come into you. No apps, no websites, no intermediaries, no advertising. That's actually the opposite of search where you have to do most of the hard work to find things you're looking for by hand. Today, we only have a few digital assistants. Who are they? Well, Siri, Alexa, Google, right? But did you know those assistants don't work for us? They don't. They work for those platforms to help make them sticky and maximize long-term profitability. On my platform, you'll keep your personal data, but you won't manage it. Instead, you'll hire a number of digital personal assistants to do your work for you. These are your digital employees. Some are managers, some are knowledge workers, some are task oriented. They work with your data in the world of information online. You can ask them questions like, like what's the name of the hotel you stayed at in Paris? Or what's the net worth? What's your net worth? Or what's Arthur's net worth? Or what's your credit card score? You can ask it questions based on your data. The top level, they're your doctor, lawyer, financial advisor, career coach, chauffeur, fitness instructor, even your dating coach. If you don't like one or a better one comes along, replace it. Your data always stays in your personal data locker. This is a competitive marketplace. These bots are made by for-profit companies who compete to provide you with the best and safest digital assistance. Now, I'm tracking dozens of projects that want to help people leverage their own personal data. They have the right business model. Their incentives are aligned with customers, but they're all funded with just a million or $2 million. They have, they have a small team. They have to build apps, infrastructure, customer service, compliance. They got to be found in the app store. You have to download and set up an account and all that before they can start helping you. Apps are traps. How many apps do you have? The average user has 20. You have more? I do. How many people are excited about getting more apps? Anybody? <laughs> the goal of my project is to give consumers a single platform with no apps, no accounts, where everything comes to you when you ask for it. It has to be easy, but you'll have to pay a bit because there's no advertising. So what I'm building is horizontal. It's a platform for others to build on top of. Let's see how that would work for us in the real world. So you walk into your doctor's office and your watch or your earbud will say, want me to check you in? Or it just does it automatically because it knows you're, it made the appointment itself. You don't fill out any forms. Just say, yeah, sure. Your digital medical advocate program will then share all the data your doctor needs, but not more. 
Last month, I got an x-ray of my foot. Why isn't a copy of that automatically sent to my personal data locker? Oh, because we don't have personal data lockers. It should be easy to collect and use and mine and analyze our own personal data. Tesla is a platform. You probably haven't read the end user license agreement from Tesla, have you? Well, you can do anything you want with your driving data, except move it to another platform. So if you have another car, or if you rent a car, or you sell your car, you need to keep track of all your transportation data on several different systems by hand. Doesn't that make you angry and upset? <laughs> In my world, your personal data locker is your chauffeur. You hire the algorithm that drives whatever car you're allowed to drive. It has a full record of everywhere you've been. It knows where your home is. It knows where to pick up your kids from school. It can go pick up your groceries or your grandmother by itself. It's your data. It's your driving preferences. And it interacts with your insurance company to let your car start in the first place. Now, this is independent of the device. It's independent of the data. And you can replace your digital chauffeur if you find a better one any time. It won't be long before you can get your entire genome sequenced. Where will that data live? Hmm, Pfizer will be happy to store it for you. They'll do it for free. They'll probably pay you to do it. Oh, and they'll make it super easy, but they won't share it with other drug companies. Wouldn't you rather pay about $5 a year to store your genomic data on your server and give access to your data on your terms? Would you pay $5 a year for that? Because if the answer is no, you're in the wrong webinar right now. I made a movie showing a day in the life of a typical user, which you can see on your own when you have time. And I'll paste it into the uh, comment, into the, the comment box in a minute. Here's the URL though, if you're just watching on, on, on uh, YouTube later. So look, the platform is the new business model. Time on platform is the new business metric. I want to build a platform where the consumer is at the center and I make no profit. My platform will serve billions of people, create tens of thousands of jobs and a new economy to replace the vampire platforms we have today. In fact, we have an opportunity now to work with a province in one of the largest countries in Africa, a province with more than 2 million people to give them a way to collect their own data and interact with government services. In Africa, the advertising model is going to be less effective than in, than in the United States. And that gives us an advantage. With strong donors, we can create a platform that over 100 million people will use every day. In North America, over 38 million people have now seen the social dilemma. That's 38 million people who are aware of the problem and would consider switching to something better. I think it's possible to get our first million users from that population and grow from there. All right, now I'm gonna summarize by translating from the original Elvish because I assume your Elvish is a bit rusty. There's a prophecy, one app to rule them all, one app to find them, one app to delete them all and with privacy and personal data bind them. That's what it says right there. How often do you see Elvish in a presentation? In my world, there are no handsets, no apps. So let's disrupt the status quo and build what people actually need. A heretic challenges the prevailing assumptions. Giordano Bruno was the last person burned at the stake in 1600 by the Catholic Church for writing that the earth revolves around the sun and that everything is made up of tiny particles we can't see. They killed him. Bruno's death paved the way for other mavericks like, Gal mavericks like Galileo to be more tolerated as more and more evidence showed they were right and the church was wrong. Bruno was a heretic a pain in the ass and a truth seeker. The pandemic has been tragic, but it has dramatically accelerated the digital economy. The mobile advertising market this year is expected to be over $200 billion, which will continue to accelerate the platforms taking over our lives. $200 billion worth of advertising on handsets. Much of this is aimed at our kids. You might have noticed that most apps are now free. How free are they really? I'm starting a revolution to create a safe haven for those of us who value privacy.
Now, let me give you a few reasons you shouldn't support my project, okay? First, it's risky. It should be risky. If it weren't risky, I wouldn't have a chance to move the needle to change society to disrupt a $600 billion a year industry. Incremental improvement is not gonna get us out of the trap we're in. Could it fail? It could absolutely fail, but it's not a startup. It's a nonprofit. So if people believe in us, we'll just keep going until we succeed, until we catch on, find that need that we can fill and then expand. The risk is not being able to raise the money we need to try in the first place. It's undefined. Sure, we need to look for our real world opportunities to help a billion people in Africa. We're gonna to have to find partners there and work with them to solve African problems. To enter the US market, we need to find parents and kids looking for an alternative. But if you believe in the core idea of one single app that consolidates your data and provides a market of for-profit solutions that you pay for with no advertising, then you should consider helping us build and shape that future. There are security issues. People say this all the time. Yeah, but how secure is your data right now? You, more of your data is in India than it is probably in the United States right now. Not only are companies getting hacked and losing your data, they're actively selling it. We can use the same security technology your bank uses, but you have the keys. I won't have access to your data. We are less secure keeping the way things the way they are now. And by the way, India isn't particularly less secure. Your, your data is all over the world. That's what makes it less secure. This isn't for everyone. Some people would like to see more regulation, better education. I wanna build an alternative platform so people have a choice. So ultimately what powers this is not Apple's algorithm, but my platform natively. That, or what, whatever replaces this because the cloud is gonna be where the action is. So billions of people around the world don't have to agree to Apple and Google's terms. So our children aren't being manipulated and targeted all day long. So we can build a less corrupt future for society and pay a little bit to stay in control because this isn't about technology. This is about freedom. What is that freedom worth to you? to society. I need a budget of $10 million a year to try again. Have I radicalized you? Have I gotten you angry enough to join my band of rebels going up against huge companies and change the world? I hope a few people will want to join me to get it started. Again. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, once again, I've, I've had the benefit of seeing this prior and then talking to David about this quite a bit. So I'm, I'm uh, inspired. So once again, thank you very much. So um, we have a couple questions, but uh, let me ask one first, if it's okay. Uh, in the context of what one would do as an alternative, in other words, if people recognize this is a problem, and they don't want to get exposed to the me being the product right now. Aside from going on this mission and fixing it, what are right. what? Are, I guess I'm pointing out that there really isn't an alternative right now. Aside well, from I mean, there really the is, there really is. And so there's this book, "Privacy is Power," and there are other books by there's a guy named Nir Ayal who's really concerned about children spending time on platforms. And they are going to give you a whole roadmap to how you can how you can reconstrain and reconfigure your digital environment right now for you for your kids. Uh, this is why Apple is starting to give you feedback on how much screen time every you know that there's getting more of this is getting regulated right. So the, this is a very active area of regulation. And uh, the guy who did how many people have seen I don't know if they can they can do a poll or anything but but I think a lot of people here have probably seen the uh, the social dilemma. And the guy who started it, uh, he, he started the, a thing called the um, Center for Humane Technology. And they're working really hard on, uh, on um, regulation, on, on really lobbying for better regulation. So here we have a poll, right? What's your, can, do we have the poll open? Can people see the poll? Um, so it's been not launched. 
It says that the uh, people are viewing it. We've got a few votes. Okay. So if you want to vote, uh, I'm just interested in people uh, who have seen the movie, who are concerned, how concerned are you, right? Now, you know, privacy comes up and I mentioned, you know, you could find out Arthur Bavellis, you know, net worth. Well, not, you know, so it depends how close you are with him, right? Because we're all going to have these layers of data that we control and we put locks around. And there are things that I will allow my family to see that I won't let my friends to see and, and maybe business associates and so forth. So it's what you want to allow people to see. And what we have right now, what we have is a Google search where you know any you could see any number of things and most of it could be wrong. It's hard, it's impossible to know, right? So if you want the accurate information about yourself, <laughs> you should be able to mine it, right? And if you want to share or exchange information with your doctor, your lawyer, for example, your therapist, your friends, you know, you should be able to control that. And it should be really easy to do. And that's that's kind of to me the challenge, those those contracts between parties. And for example, I share a picture with you, and then later, for whatever reason, I want to unshare it. Well, it depends, right? If we took it together, then then you should have as much right to it as I should. And that all can be negotiated and it can be all be digital and we could just, it could just work much better than the uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, unstructured way we do it today. So um, just uh, so far, we've got 75% of the vote in, feel like I'm, I'm announcing the presidential election. 33% uh, concerned in general, 33% concerned will be willing to try no new alternative and 50% concerned it would like to be part of the solution. So thanks for all that guys for participating. Awesome. Uh, you know, if you really want to lean forward into this, please contact me. You may not have a million dollars to give me. Um, if you do, I'd be, I really don't want to talk to, to donors, but you might be able to connect me to people and that would be every bit as helpful. I'm very much in fundraising mode, hoping to get my core team together as soon as I've raised the money. By the way, I'm already 503C compliant and, and fully tax deductible and I have all that worked out. So you answered it, but since it's a question, let's, how do you plan to guarantee data privacy for the individuals? So just a question from the well, audience. I mean, yeah, things are so bad right now. If you read some of these books, you do a little homework, it's really, your data is everywhere. And every, anyone who wants your social security number can get it for all, basically for no money. It just doesn't take very much. Uh, and then out, that opens a whole lot of doors. So uh, I bet this question is good. How do you, how do you get, so, so right now we have a really bad system and my goal, and as long as we use Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg is going to continue to sell your data to, to advertisers. It's going to be available to, you know that, I, you may not know this, Arthur, uh, drug companies are legally allowed to buy your entire history. Let's say you've been to 50 different uh, pharmacies over your life, okay? There are companies that consolidate all that. They have every prescription you've ever filled for the last 30 years. Trust me, it doesn't matter how many in the United States. And com drug companies can buy that for $700. There is a bill, in, part of that bill that went through Congress says that you can't get it. You can't pay the $700 and get that information. Only drug companies. Can. Only drug companies, yeah. I've actually noticed that traveling for the last six months and going to a doctor in a town and a doctor was unfamiliar and they said, oh, is this you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Um, right. so, so what about, uh, and this is not to be the devil's advocate, but uh, yeah. what about those of us who, and I'm not in this camp necessarily, although I pretty much acquiesce that nothing's gonna be private. So I try to do things that won't be on the front page. Um, the- uh, Good idea. Is it hopeless? Meaning- um, A lot I is out of the bag. A lot is out of the bag already. I mean, yeah. you might as well tell your kids that whatever they send to anybody can be, can show up anywhere, anytime. There's, you know, trust is not the best uh, approach, you know, uh, cryptography is the best approach, right? We're going to have to get control of our own data and, and be able to undo things under contract if we want to. We're a long way from that. There's a there's a really good guy named Doc Searles who's working on those set of contracts so that you you set up contracts with your vendors on exactly what your rights are. For example, you send your sizes to a company to uh, to have them make you a new pair of clothes or you send some uh, 
information to have dental implants or for a new drug or something. Now, what can that company do after they deliver your drug or your product and, and they've got your data, what can they do with it, right? Or, or even you send your address to a company to send you something. Can they keep that? Can they send you, can they sell that to somebody else? And that's the kind of thing we wanna be able to, to control much better. So um, there's a question here, how do you plan to, on getting a core user base and what right. will early adopters get from this? Right, it's use case by use case. It's the same as any company like Facebook started. What did they do? They solved a small problem for a small number of people, right? So we've got, I've got probably 40 groups out there putting together startup solutions for these things. Uh, search engines, privacy, medical, uh, um, you know, uh, navigating and so forth. There's a bunch of them and we want to work with those guys to go out. So they will go after the end user vertical solutions, right? They'll help you check into your doctors or they'll help you navigate your car to, you know, where you're going and so forth. We'll work with them. My goal is to, to do the horizontal platform underneath them. So they will solve the chicken and egg problem with the customer and I will give them a lot of power to be able to do that. Right, so, and the cool thing is, once you use it once for one solution, then it's more available for you to reuse and get more leverage next time you use another solution, right? So you made a, a comparison with Kayak, um, and I know things are yet to be determined in many ways about how this is gonna look, I guess, but if you had to uh, sort of describe mm -hmm. how works um your layer and i i can i can do that uh let me um here i'm just going to put into the i'm going to share with everybody attendees this if you want to click on this now and watch it later this is the Got 10 it. minute video i made for the day of a life of somebody who's using this and it, it shows exactly so one of the ways I think of this, and I wrote a chapter about it in my book, I don't remember which one, but it's called Passive Commerce. So you're always on the lookout for, let's say a job, right? You, maybe you're happy with your job, fine. But if a better job came along that you liked more or paid better or something, would you consider it? Yeah, probably not, not too many people are 100% close to that. And it's the same with selling your car or maybe renting your apartment for a weekend while you're away. What, you know, you shouldn't have to list that on eBay. You should just sort of put it into your personal data locker and say it's available. Now we're just talking about price. So you can just raise your price, whether it's for, for a job or for renting your place out, or you could rent your car to a movie company or whatever. You know, this B2B sharing, this sharing, sorry, C2C sharing economy could be done passively so that you're not actively trying to do it. You just say, yeah, I've got these things and they're available now, or I'm looking for a something tell me when you find it, right? So it might be, for example, you'd be interested in a Caribbean vacation uh, during this week for a certain amount of money and you do some searching or whatever and it's not there. Why can't that search just keep working for you? So that in the morning it says, hey, I found something, right? I mean, computers, software can do this, right? That's what these agents will do for you. So the or same would apply if it's not passive, right? That's right, but the general idea is that everything comes to you so that you don't have to repeat the search. I mean, I'm on eBay all the time for looking for stuff. I have to kind of research to see if there's new things listed in my interest categories, right? Mm -hmm. And if I just put it in my, like if you think of your personal data locker, you have your wants and your haves, the things you have and the things you want. Just specify what you want and your bots should just be looking all over the place for it. And you wake up in the morning and it should say, hey, I found it. So aside from the $10 million a year budget, if you had to make an estimate of how long it would take to, to get it so people would adopt it. Yeah, it's really hard. I've got a, I've got a website, it's, it's giordano.institute, right? And there's a roadmap and the roadmap says, look, this is not linear. Okay, it's not predictable. It's like any software or something. Almost certainly we'll just pivot, right? We're pretty much planning to pivot. But you could imagine, for example, <clears throat> that if people would put their names and you know their their they start a social network that way and start connecting to their friends the way we all did on LinkedIn, you know, years ago, 
then, you know, that could just get it started. And that messaging, you know how a lot of people have switched to Signal? If, you, if you're still using WhatsApp, you should understand everybody's going to Signal, okay? Signal is far more secure and they don't sell your data to other people, okay? So, so switch, switch, it's a good idea. I recommend if you've got friends on WhatsApp, Me. tell them to switch. So the WhatsApp people can see this, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> they, they can see it on their dashboard. People are leaving WhatsApp. Why? Because they're selling your data to people. And, and your behavior. And if people can switch to Signal, well, maybe we can integrate or maybe we, because Signal is a fantastic open source project. Maybe we can find some way, you know, to offer that, like your persistence of your personal data and connect it to Signal. So on Signal, you could then say, oh yeah, here's my birth date or here's my, my address or whatever. So some simple things that would help start us building your personal graph would be one example. Right. Another example, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, he founded the, he started the, the World Wide Web. He's building some open source software and he calls it your pod uh, and you'll have your, your personal, you know, data store. And so we could use that. And he's got a whole development community of people and they have a once a month get togethers and, and you know, they have a showcase and they're building for profit stuff. So, so it's these kinds of community things that we're hoping to get into. I Is just need the money because I want to have a core development team to start putting this app together so everybody can build on top of it. Is it fair to uh, ask about uh, your opinion or how, if at all, GDPR plays into any of this? Sure, because you have, as soon as you have one European on your platform, the Data Protection Rights Act in, in Europe, and by the way, they're working on the second version of it, <clears throat> you know, you, you're forced to come into play. So in my view, that has, I think, 24 basic, you know, terms that you have to comply with, something like that. And my view is that we should just be compliant with all of them all the time. So, so one of them is the right to be forgotten if you don't want to be on a platform. But in my situation, in my platform, you're always forgotten <laughs> because it's yours. You can cut off, you know, the, the, the door to anybody, any time, right? And I have I have ideas on how that would work with an e-commerce company, for example. You could sort of withdraw your data or apply when you're ready to buy and they need your address, you could apply it with a contract and then they'll send you something, but you withdraw it when you're not using it. And that would be GDPR compliant. And by the way, those companies under GDPR operating under, they don't want the, the responsibility or the liability of your personal data. They don't want it. No, they they're, don't. Using, they're using intermediaries. They're using consultants and paying a lot of money to put up kind of a, a, a Chinese wall, right? Between them and their customers' personal data, right? So this is just that same thing, except you own it and it's basically nonprofit and it, it might be mostly open source, but some of it might not be open source for various reasons. How, how would one, uh, uh, is going to the website, looking at the video, calling you, uh, inch people along, to, who are clearly by the poll interested in having something to do with this is a good way to, you know, we all have lots of things to do and bandwidth issues and all that kind of stuff. So the best thing, the best thing, Arthur, is I want to have conversations with potential donors. I mean, $10 million is not a small amount of money. So, and people with assets have made, have done very well in the last year. I'm very, you know, we're all aware of that. The question is what can we, how do we move the needle with our philanthropic budget? Because I'm not a startup. I'm not looking, I'm not going to, my payoff is in helping billions of people, right? So, so let's have conversation. I want to hear what people are interested in, because that will determine, you know, what the spend is um, and what what I can do. And so, it's if, conversations that I'm really shooting for. Fair enough. And if one were to think about people in their network and people that they know, can you paint a profile that so far that you've gotten? Good indication yeah. from the types of people that are willing to vote with their checkbook here. Yeah, this was really abstract and hard six months ago, but then the 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 social dilemma came out, and so my conversations with people over the last few months have been much better because they've seen it and they've said, "You saw it." You, I said, "Have you seen it?" You said, "Yes, I saw it." We should talk, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I've had people say, "I've seen the scary movie." Right. You know, so so the first question I ask anybody is, have you seen the social dilemma? And if the answer is yes, and it was scary, then I say, oh, good. Can we talk? And 
so far, you know, it, it doesn't happen right away. Uh, I've got several people very interested, but you know, the first, uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I solved the chicken and egg problem, you know, getting the first people, yeah. but I really think I'll have about 5 million in the next five or six months. And I think I will end this year with 10 million. Um, so anybody who can help move that along, let's have conversations. I want to listen to what it takes because people who do have those resources have a lot of friends. Uh, yeah. You know, it's really, there's tons of money. It's, yeah, lots, it's lots, of money liquidity. lots of liquidity. Lots of liquidity out there. Right, and I'm, and I'm uh, fully tax deductible. So it's a, good, it's a good year. Last year was a good year. <laughs> this year will probably be another good year to get tax out. Uh, but it's also, it's going to come out of your philanthropic budget already. And I just ask people to look at their philanthropic portfolio as at, you know, what things can move the needle at scale now. Now that digital is so accelerated, you should start moving your philanthropic portfolio toward digital. Is, is it, uh, let me ask it a little differently, and I'm not saying you avoided the question, <laughs> but uh, helping the people on the call and others to paint the profile of the person or entity is it a private investor that's made a lot of money? Is it, it could be all of the above, but is it a foundation? Is it, is it, you know, so, sort of help single people. decision maker. It's a single decision maker because, because committees have a hard time, you know, starting something new. They'll, they'll get along with, they'll go along with something that's already going and has results and has more metrics. Right. So it's going to be single decision makers. Ideally it's, it's tech entrepreneurs who've sold a company, but then some of them are in like, you know, Reed Hoffman would be an example. He's, he's a billionaire because of LinkedIn, but he makes his money on advertising. So he's, you know, uh, Bill Gates. These are and flying cars, right? <laughs> these are not the people that I'm trying to get money from. Elon Musk, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah, his, his end user license agreement is very aggressive. Um, so I'm not expecting a call from Elon. <laughs> right. uh, I do hope people of means will think of how, okay, how can we put our heads together and get you the money you need? Yeah. Um, because this is important. Um, I'm, by the way, I'm, I'm not so much looking for startups right now. If you are a startup, please send me your details because I've got a list on my website of all the projects that are in this area, but I'm really in fundraising mode right now. Yeah, thanks for answering that, David. So is there anything else you'd like to share with us um, before we wrap up? I think the digital economy is coming, right? It's, it's not just, I mean, it's here, it's upon us. It's this world of being trapped and these are supercomputers in our pockets and we're running them with like an operating system from the 1990s. This is like a mini Mac desktop, right? They don't talk, you have noticed, they don't talk to each other, but the only thing they can do in common is uh, move you over to your email program or move you over to Google Maps or some of them incorporate Google Maps. Uh, but most of these things are impossible to find and don't have the right model. My, my brother's starting a cool company. This is just another an example of the, one of the use cases that you, your prescriptions, usually the doctor says, where do you want your prescription? And you say CVS or whatever, you're you know, across the street. Well, in their case, you, you move your, your prescription to Meds by Me, which is an online pharmacy. And then from there, you can, you put your, your prescription to bid and you can see it's cool. You can see on a Google map what the price of your prescription for your drug is on a map in your city. And it's remarkable the differences in price. So you can just choose one that's half the price and CVS is usually twice the price. CVS is usually way up on the price scale because they've charged a lot for market. They, they spend a lot on marketing. So these kinds of problems are the ones we wanna solve and that eventually my goal is that whatever device you're using is just going to natively use my, my operating system and you're not going to have Apple and Android in the middle anymore. That's, that's my ultimate goal. Super cool. Um, really appreciate you doing this again for us today. Make sure that everybody gets in touch with you. And uh, the, like I said, we're going to record this. So please feel free, uh, our guests today, to, to think about how uh, this impacts you. And, and the thing that struck me the most, David, is not about me as much as my children and, right. the children and their children, because right. 
I might be a hopeless case in terms of acquiescing to any new construct or method of doing things. And I'm, and I'm you know, not, uh, it's not unknown to me to, to have to change and adjust all the time. But I think the biggest impact and the, uh, the, the our children are unaware of how dangerous this all is. And so um, that's one of the things that I'm super fond of, of what you're doing. How many hours a day are your kids spending on those devices? And that is only gonna go up and you can't take them away. That's never going to work, right? So we need a better solution. That's it. Well, once again, excellent job. Thank you, David. And thank you thank all you. for joining with us today and sharing with us the only thing you can't make more of and that's your time. Till next time, thank you. Take care. You're welcome. Thanks.